Ah, book by book. We're very thrilled indeed to be sharing with you here in this little makeshift studio with our own resident participants in this time of Bible study, sharing with you at home or whether you're in a student seminar, whether you're in a big, big auditorium, or whether you're gazing at the television screen and sharing with perhaps your Bible open. And uh, we're pleased to be here. Richard Buse is my name. This is Paul Blackham, who's my colleague for a number of years, in fact. And then Dr. K.P. Johannan, who is the founder and the president of Gospel for Asia. He's in England at the moment, and we're very thrilled to have you here. Thank you. As we come to study number eight, that's what we're doing now, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and right through to chapter 11, verse 15. Not that we'll do all of these uh, passages, but we're going to try at least to do a taster, so that further Bible study can be done, perhaps with the study guide, if you've got one of those as well, that could be useful. Here we are. I'm going to read from chapter 10 and verses, verse 1. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, writes Paul, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come I may not have to be bold, as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. No wonder, by the inspiration of God, that this, these passages were allowed to reverberate through the church over many, many centuries. They're so strong, these words of Paul. How is he different to perhaps what we might call ordinary human leaders, K.P. Johannan? Well, you know, Paul is trying to get them uh, think uh, deeper about what is happening in their own life and, and how they should um, respond to him uh, and, and to Christ's call. Uh, these people, obviously, um, their thought pattern and what they believe, what they hear, uh, is, is not right. So Paul is saying, all this stuff these other teachers are saying and what you are saying, there is something deeper than all these. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so he becomes. And often people think their thoughts are their own thoughts. Some are, but there are times, like it happened in David's life, Satan put thought in his mind to number the army. Demons are genuinely real. I have seen it times when praying for demon-possessed people. I mean, a, a tiny little fragile woman, 25 men, mm. can't hold her down. Mm. She just throw them off like that. How powerful demons are. And, and Paul is saying, our battle is not what you see. It's beyond. So there's a stronghold, there's a fortress and the soldiers are demons, and a lot of people are living with habits, sins, they repent, they pray, they go for counseling, they just cannot break it. Mm. Believers I'm talking about. But they need to recognize for themselves their enemy is not God, their enemy is not brothers and sisters, the enemy is not somebody else, it is the battleground, demons are attacking them and they need to understand how to deal with it. And Paul is saying, we take responsibility to tear down the strongholds. I have spoken to demons many times. I'm harassed in my mind and confused and worried and, and sometimes horribly tempted in certain areas and I realize in the end, this is not normal. And I say, in Jesus' name, through the blood and the word, I rebuke you demons and leave me alone. Mm. And I have seen it happen so many times. And I think believers need to recognize the reality of demons. Not that we should live with always demons around of us. <laughs> but, but the reality mm. that we have the authority mm. over demons and Satan mm. because of Jesus. Yeah, the power of the blood, mm -hmm. the power of the cross. Mm -hmm. It's so tremendous, and that gives us great encouragement when we think about our adversary, the devil, and all the, those that work with him as well. How can we fulfill? Uh, look, at, look at verse 5. Go on for a moment. Uh, verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So, Paul Blackham, how can we fulfill that in every area of life? What if we're 
working, let's say, not as ministers, like uh, we are here, but as uh, people in business, medicine, catering, politics, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those verses which we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is very every strong. thought. <laughs> it is, isn't it? So every thought. Oh. And it's this, it's this sense of, look, everything in, was created through Christ, heaven and earth, and it is all sustained by him. He is the logic of everything in creation. And if we're not thinking according to that logic, there's an mm -hmm. unreality. Every, every aspect of creation uh, needs to be Christ's logic infusing it. And so I love that thing that Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian and prime minister said, there is not one inch of reality over which Christ does not proclaim, mine, mine, it's all his. And so whatever we're doing in life, we need to know this all belongs to Christ. It's not as if Sunday for an hour, that belongs to Christ, or only my quiet time belongs to Christ. Everything we do belongs to Christ. Every sphere of life, money, family, politics, education, justice, art, science, <laughs> everything yeah. is his. And, and the way we do it, we are, he, we're all full-time Christian workers. We're all full-time. Some of us are paid by... Uh, companies, some of us are placed by the government, but we're all, we're all full-time Christian workers and we're all in that place to, sh to live as Christ would live in that place and take every thought captive, every area of life. Uh -huh. um, one, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he said, whatever you do, it's in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Mm. So we must always ask, how can I bring glory to Jesus in everything that I do? How can I show the supremacy of Jesus, that his way, his logic is the, is, is the oh, everything else is illogical That's right. he is except it. that. He's a starting point. I mean, sometimes people say, I can't see where Jesus fits in. I don't know if you heard that said. Yeah. Mm. And uh, the answer to that was given actually by a wonderful theologian called Athanasius, Egyptian born and Greek trained 16 centuries ago. Athanasius said, the only system of thought into which Jesus Christ will fit is the one in which he is the starting point. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you know, we're like the man who does up his shirt buttons beginning with the wrong button. Mm. Mm. And you think, so if I go on doing it enough, it'll be... No, it'll never work. <laughs> it'll never work. <laughs> Same with those who think, you know, where does Jesus fit in? If he doesn't come at the beginning and the end of everything, mm. then they will never get the answer to what this universe is about, yeah. establish our relationship to the universe, all these things, politics, sport, wealth, creation, family, all those things, mm. they come under his dominion. Mm. It's, it's desperately important, this, this whole passage, it's wonderful to read it. Um, KP, why I uh, see here in verse 12 to 15, why is Paul still, going back to one of our previous studies, why is he still boasting? Well, Paul is, throughout the letter, um, trying to get them understand his authority and his ministry is from God and the ministry that he is sharing with them has nothing to do with himself. It's, it's a defense he is making. Again, the, the authority is not just what he said, but his very life. So he says here, uh, if, if we look at um, verse 13, mm. he says, you know, uh, we, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boast in the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. He says, the very reason I came and ministered, it had everything to do with God asking us to be there, asking me to be there. I am not looking at somebody else and say, oh, I like to have that ministry. I should do that. I should do that. Paul stayed focused doing what God called him to do. And he's trying to get them think about these false apostles who are misleading them. Mm. And he says, look at this differently. We are not like these people. And it is very important that you understand what I am talking to you is about not mere boasting like people in the world does, but I am talking to you because there's an unseen reality of God and the Holy Spirit and the powers of darkness attacking and your life means so much to me and it's important they continue to follow him. That's the reason it's like kids ask, 
Why you have to do this? Because I told you, I'm your dad. You know, the, the same thing. I think he's kind of reminding them again and again of his spiritual authority. Mm. It's also wonderful that when they, are, they have these boasters among the false apostles, and Paul sometimes meets them with a bit of boasting himself. I mean, he meets folly with folly. <laughs> though he acknowledges that what he's doing is actually folly himself, mm. you know. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that in all through Second Corinthians, Paul is not trying to say how great a ministry he built, how much money he no. gathered, how many churches he constructed, no. or how, many edu how much education he got. He basically paints a picture of suffering and also the spiritual authority that most people don't want to talk about. And I think today when we look at ministers and pastors and TV preachers, people are so confused and deceived by what is, you know, the appearance of things as so they are wonderful, but deeper level, their character, their godliness uh, is not there to match that. That's the reason we should be looking at people that we are following what is behind the scene, mm. not that we judge everybody, but at least we should be able to discern the situation. Mm. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I, I'm moving on a little bit now to uh, chapter 11. Looking at verse 3, suddenly there's an introduction of mm. Adam and Eve. Mm. <laughs> mm. Are, uh, is that because the devil's tricks are always the same that they're mentioned here? Yeah, I mean, he says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Because, you know, we might think about Ephesians 5 or the whole book of Hosea, where we learn that marriage, <coughs> um, well, the marriage of Adam and Eve and all marriage, in a sense, is a reflection of the ultimate reality between Christ and his bride, the church. And then and when Satan deceived Eve uh, and, and got her not to trust the word of Christ, that was uh, just a, a little picture of this bigger mm. agenda that, that Satan pursues in every generation, which is to corrupt the church and to make the church so that it doesn't believe in Christ. In the book of Revelation, we get that picture of Satan uh, trying to destroy the church. And 2 Corinthians then has shown us this temptation that, because we've seen that Satan's strategy is always self-interest, love yourself, mm -hmm. look after your own interests. That is the temptation that the Corinthian church is facing, to, to be self-interested and self-loving all the time. And he's saying, look, the devil in every generation, that's how he wants to corrupt the church. He did it. He's always said, follow your own interests. You know, if you want to, because he said that to Eve, you know, if you really want to be wise and you need to take charge of your mm -hmm. own situation, you eat that. And the Lord's trying to keep good things from you. Whereas, of course, we know that's not true. We, we follow him. And that's where our real good and joy and contentment is to be found, going the way of the cross. Satan always toes different, and he always wants the church to uh, take their own, you know, to say, I, I, if I'm going to be happy, if I'm going to be contented, if I'm going to find life, I must seize it for myself. Christ says, no, if you want to find life, you must lose your life and lay it down in sacrificial giving for others. And it's those two voices and um, really yeah. Paul's saying, look what happened when Eve listened to that voice. Yeah, there are two voices. I mean, it says here in verse uh, 4, if oh, someone yeah. comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the mm -hmm. Jesus we preached, uh, actually, KP, as we saw almost rounding off, how can we discern the genuine Holy Spirit as opposed to the false spirits? So if the devil can appear as an angel of light, that's chapter 11, verse 14, how can we recognize that being so? You know, I've been saying this for a long time. The greatest crisis in Christendom today, Christians having no discernment. Mm. They, they're going after every wind of new doctrines, whether barking or crawling or falling down or this and that, everything else. The, the problem is people's lack of intimacy with the Lord. The Holy Spirit came to take the things of Christ and reveal that to us. So someone to have discernment understanding, I think it is very, very critical that they, they stay close to the Lord through meditating God's word, looking at Christ's life and seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. And honestly, every single day I pray this prayer, Lord, today give me discernment mm. when I meet people, when I hear voices, when I read the email, 
when I had to answer telephone call. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is it's very, very significant that these last days more people are going to be led astray from the truth by people who say they are a person Christ, but they are after money, they are after building their own kingdom, they are drawing disciples to themselves, and people are deceived, not one or two, but masses are, are right now in the condition. To the extent I think today, church is going through dark ages. Experience and man's teaching and advices and how to do things has become the means for people, pastors, churches, Christian leaders to make the decisions, not the word of God. Mm -hmm. How to build your church, how to build your family, how to feel good. Yes, and I yes. think this is devastating. And this, we can very clearly say, this is not representing Christ. And we should stay away from that. And to me, to find a godly individual who know God, it's worth spending half hour with that individual, like Paul, than spending 50 years with a cuckoo guy who knows all about everything in the world, but will not help me to understand Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. As we round off, then it is a prayer. In the old Church of England prayer book of many hundred years ago, the, the, the collect, as it's called, a special appointed prayer for Whit Sunday. Do you know what it asks for? Only one thing. It doesn't ask for power from on high or for miracles, though of course we believe in the possibility of miracles. But no, it asks for one thing, a right judgment mm. in all things. When I was young, I used to think, how dull, <laughs> a right judgment in mm. all things. Now I come to see what a wonderful thing. Mm. If a Christian worker, missionary, clergyman, Bible study leader, Sunday school leader, an everyday Christian with their Bible, can get it right time after time, day after day. What a gift that is from God, to have a right judgment mm. in all things. And so prevent a church from becoming a wrecked church. Mm.